And on that note, we're going to go over to our next interview here. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Karan Aurora from uh, Beckman Coulter. Uh, Karan is the Senior VP of Marketing Strategy and Product Insights. And uh, I think I had the pleasure of chatting with him a couple of weeks ago in the lead up to this, uh, to this interview. Hello, Karan, can you hear me? Yeah, Jerry, he can hear you fine. Thanks for the introduction. No, wonderful, wonderful to have you on. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm sure the audience would love to get a bit of a background on yourself. So if you could take two or three minutes, just letting everybody know what your journey has been uh, up to Beckman Coulter. Yeah, uh, a quick uh, background. So uh, I am uh, basically academically um, you know, trained as a biochemistry undergrad and pre-med. Uh, I did a master's in technology and did my MBA from Kellogg, after which I spent uh, probably um, some time in consulting between Capgemini and McKinsey. And then post that, uh, you know, I had stints in pharma between Novartis and AstraZeneca, and then being primarily also in the diagnostics industry between Abbott and now Beckman. Um, the last role that I had was as a chief commercial and digital officer for AstraZeneca before assuming this new role at Beckman Coulter, which is a Danaher operating company. And uh, most of my experience, I would say, has been in three domains. Uh, it's been on the side of strategy, digital, and innovation uh, with sort of an underlying on business development and, uh, you know, aspects. So I've built uh, two digital health businesses uh, within company that have successfully become part of the PNL as a separate BU or have been exited uh, successfully. And I've led uh, successful digital transformations at, at three large uh, sort of uh, pharma diagnostic companies. And in my present role, uh, the ambition is really to think about, you know, how we take a very old, 100-year-old diagnostic company and uh, think about, you know, all the innovative possibilities around digital uh, biomarkers uh, and, you know, additional biomarkers coming through the value of data and use that to sort of transform and bring medicine earlier to patients. So very excited to be here. Oh, it's exciting to have you on. It's such, a, it's such an impressive and, uh, and rich background uh, Thank that you, you have, uh, Karan, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so one of the things that I th we'd love you to um, uh, give us a bit more detail on is explaining that pilot to scale strategy uh, within digital health. Yeah, and I'll probably start with uh, saying that, you know, I've learned it through painful failures is what I would say. <laughs> and, you know, when I started early in my career, which is uh, probably 15 years ago when we started venturing into digital and we started with, you know, putting uh, decision support tools in pumps uh, at a company called Hospira, which was really to alleviate pains for nurses uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, what the medication doses should be and automate that. It, it was a class three device, uh, you know, when you were putting those algor algorithms on. And at the time, you can imagine there weren't any regulated cloud platforms. There wasn't any, uh, you know, QMS built in for digital, uh, you know, sort of building of tools for at least on a software end. And all of that had to be homegrown. And, you know, the biggest learning I had is there was a lot of time spent on the clinical sort of efficacy of the product being built. And to be honest, like when you went to the nurses, they all said, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, you know, all of the researchers saw the value in the data and said, this would save a lot of time. It's really good for patients. And the time we spent very little thinking about was a commercial adoption. And, you know, we didn't think about pricing, the value chain, didn't think about how it get incorporated into, into sort of current pathways and treatments. And, uh, you know, when we launched, the biggest challenge became not that the POC wasn't successful or the data wasn't generating value, the issue became who actually pays for it? How do we scale it? How does it become part of the treatment regimen? How do I think about change management around patient pathways? Um, and, you know, how do I think about playing in the ecosystem versus, you know, doing this alone? And I think those learnings from 15 years ago is sort of what, you know, has kept me sort of thinking about commercial at the forefront. And, you know, it's almost the inverse R&D table, uh, you know, where if you think about drug development or diagnostic development, you always think about building a great clinical product and then launching it into a machine. And whereas with software uh, or software related products, you have to almost do the inverse. You have to think about market fit and commercial and how you would scale first and then go backwards into the R&D cycle to say, you know, how should I then build this product to get maximum scale? So I think that is a nuance uh, that's quite critical. 
Yeah, no, it's spot on. Uh, you know, I think it's definitely something, you know, it's definitely one of the main things you definitely have to think about, you know, you know in that instance. Uh, for those, you know, that aren't you know, so clued up, uh, you know, on the audience side, it'd be great if you could go into a little bit more detail around about, you know, uh, or, sorry, around, you know, what a monetization plan kind of looks like uh, and stuff. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you a recent example. It's public. So, you know, we built a digital health platform at AstraZeneca, which was successfully exited to a company called Yuma Therapeutics out of the UK. And, you know, the key thing there was trying to figure out, you know, we're building this remote monitoring chronic disease management platform. And, and the value in that was that you could discharge at-risk chronic patients onto the platform uh, from the hospital and, you know, vitals could be managed proactively, thereby not having the patients crash back into re-hospitalizations or readmissions. And, you know, this, and, and basically it was algorithm driven and, uh, you know, clinically it was very beneficial. It was uh, very impactful to sort of, you know, your cardiologist or your pulmonologist or nephrologist, you know, for chronic patients, it aggregated information for them. And when you think about pricing there, you know, you, you had a couple of ideas you could go with. You could go with one idea where you could say, look, I'm going to charge providers uh, for this. And then you quickly realize that in the value chain, you know, providers have very low margin. They can't really afford to pay for it. Then you say, you know, I go to pairs and then the challenge becomes like, you know, you do have, you don't have enough body of evidence where the pairs are ready to actually reimburse you. And then you actually think about, you know, where does this actually bring the biggest value? And, you know, this is a little bit of the question, Jerry, you are asking is, you know, we have to think about what is the utility at the end of this. And the utility was very simple. It was actually saving time for clinicians to manage their patient populations. And that was an you know, operational metric that the hospital tracked and it carried value against it. So one way to monetize very early on was actually go into a risk um, share on the operational metric with the CEO of the hospital and show that actually was reducing time and sort of producing capacity back into the system. And that allowed us to actually capture a uh, significant amount of revenue and as a result scaled into the institution. So I think, you know, and that's just a example that there are others, but I think, you know, if you step back, the most important thing to realize is spend a lot of time on sort of the pricing and the value chain and the economics of how money is made and where you fit into that equation. And if you're not meaningfully actually disrupting that equation, then monetization becomes very, very difficult. Yeah, no, thank you for the, you know, thank you for that very detailed example there. Uh, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, I'm sure it, uh, it resonates with a lot of the audience that we have in the crowd. Uh, just as we wrap up uh, and we wait for the uh, other panelists just to come on, uh, if you could just quickly, just kind of very quickly summarize how we can kind of understand, you know, how to fit into the ecosystem, you know, in particular for B2B solutions and, and how clinicians uh, are being embedded into the pathway. Uh, that would be really wonderful to hear about. Yeah, and you know, I think um, if I look at a lot of the B two B digital health startups, right? I think many of them, for for the right reasons, you know, went the B two C route or the employer route because the monetization, you know, seemed um, to be there. The challenge with that is retention and a lot of churn. So you know, your cost of acquisition remains high for a very long time. And obviously, gold standard is getting the B two B customers in place. You know, my my recommendation is look beyond you know, just going directly to the providers and pairs. Actually, a lot of these B2B platforms underestimate the value in the data they accumulate, and they should spend time thinking through the data strategy and the value of that data to other entities in that ecosystem, for example, pharma or diagnostics, uh, and, you know, approach them as customers. And I think now, at least in the last year, I've seen that to be happening a lot more than it was previously. You know, a lot of these uh, smaller companies are going direct to market. So I think that ecosystem uh, thinking is really important. I think building a data strategy is critical early on. Like don't focus too much on the platform. Think also about the value in the data and curating it and being able to share it and have others mine it and use it. And then the third is, you know, be innovative on your business models, right? So uh, without disclosing, you know, there, there are some startups that are very rigid and build a SaaS model and, you know, and when the when the contracting around that model doesn't work, then it's very hard for them to pivot into a different business model mindset where the others I've met where they're like, well, you know, let's get into a risk share agreement and, you know, let's, um, why don't you do the initial, you know, investment and we'll trade some equity in return. And, you know, then they get you more vested. So 
you know, I think be open to different forms of business models. And it's really important to try and gain traction and scale early on. Otherwise, you know, as this sort of, I would say, domain grows, you know, the incumbent who has scale is actually standing to win versus the best solution, right? So think about scale. It's really important. No, I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for sharing those insights for us, yeah. Karan, because we had a lot of technical insights earlier from, you know, of course, founders of these different wonderful emerging tech uh, solutions. And it's really great to get the business and the strategy uh, insight that I think some of the audience was really looking for in terms of, uh, you know, that care delivery and, and, and monetization models and stuff. So thank you so much for your time. Everybody, if you want to hear more examples and uh, and connect with Karan. His uh, his details are in the chat, so please feel free to connect with him. Uh, and if you can join us later for the post event uh, breakout sessions, uh, Karan, it will be it will be wonderful to have you. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Thanks so much. Okay, okay.